Okay, we're in Mark chapter 4. We're going to be starting in verse 21. The nuts and bolts of the kingdom. We've been studying the kingdom and what it means. And now today, Christ is going to give us some parables, four parables. And how does the kingdom affect us? So we're going to study the, the nuts and the bolts of the kingdom. Now, some of the nuts and bolts are little. Some of them are medium-sized. Some of them, you're going to have to look this way, are big. Now, what are nuts and bolts for? Now, which one is the nut and which one is the bolt? Which one's which? Okay, the nuts are all out here. This is the bolt. Okay, so we're nuts and bolts. Yes, they're both equally important. Some of them are just better looking than others. Okay, now look at this. This is something that holds something together. Well, what are nuts and bolts for? Secure something, hold things together to build stuff. Have you ever put together your child's uh, Christmas present bicycle? Man, I've put together a lot of those, and it's so disgusting at the very end when you finish the last bike and you have three nuts left and one bolt. And you know when he gets on there, something's going to fall off. Because these, these things are important. Some things are bigger than others. Some things are kind of medium with a little bit more working pieces. This one has, this one has a really cool one on it. And then you've got the little nuts and the little bolts. And we're going to study how things work today in the kingdom. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom. He's been describing it to us and what it is. And now he's going to tell us why that's important to us. So in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 21, Also he said to them, Okay, also he said to them, This is going to be important. Is a lamp brought to be put under a, bas a basket, under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? Hide it under a bushel o? No, I'm going to let it shine. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. How many ears do we have on our head? Okay, we got one mouth, but we got two ears. What should we be doing twice as much of? Okay, he says, if anybody's got ears to hear, that means all of us. How many of you have ears in here today? Okay. Everybody listen up because this is what he says. Point number one, in the kingdom, nothing is lost. Now, I'm going to change that word just lost. Let's change it to hidden. In the kingdom, nothing is hidden. Everything is going to be set on a lampstand. Everything's going to be brought to light. There's not going to be anything hidden. So what in the world is he going to be talking about here today? I want you to turn with me to Romans. We'll come back to Mark, so don't lose it. Go with me to Romans chapter 14. It's to your right. Romans 14, starting in verse 10. Now, I'm having to adapt to this because some of you are using your phones because you've got Bibles on your phones, which is a good thing. But if you're using your phones, you get there a lot faster than we do using hard copies. So just hang on. Verse 10. Romans 14, 10. We're going to read through verse 12. Why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all... Now you need to underline it, or circle it, or yellow it. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, every, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So we're going to all stand before the judgment seat, and we're all going to give an account of ourselves to God. Nothing in the kingdom is hidden. Oh, brother. Oh, man. Now, I'm looking at Gordon Ray. But he's looking back at me. And there's not going to be anything in the kingdom that's hidden. I don't want to know that much about him. And I don't want him to know that much about me. 
But we're, we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not looking good for the home team here. Have you read that before? Oh, well, okay. Let's go to the right, to 2 Corinthians. Go to your right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Boy, it got quiet in this church all of a sudden. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 10. He's going to say it again. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Well, you think? We persuade men. Okay, now Jesus is going to give a parable about how the kingdom is going to affect us. And so far, it's affected us. We're going to all stand before the king. We're going to all stand before the throne. We're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it says that everyone is going to receive what he's done, whether, oh boy, whether good or bad. Folks, this is not looking good for the home team. I'm glad I'm a preacher, so I didn't sin as much as you guys did. <laughs> I was looking for the lightning bolt. Good to have you back in church, brother. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do here? Well, while we're in Corinthians, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So go to your left to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 12. This is the principle of the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom. Chapter 3, starting in verse 12. It starts to get a little better for us here. Now if anyone builds on this foundation, Christ... If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's works will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's works of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has done on it, endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved Yet so is through fire. Well, now, I'm okay with God burning up my bad stuff. How about you? Okay, so let's don't give up just yet. We're talking about the rules of the kingdom, the principles, and how this affects us. And nothing's going to be hidden. Nothing's going to be hidden that's out there. But, but how is that going to affect Christians, believers? Okay, I want you to look at a couple more verses. We're going to look at two or three more verses, and these are going to be good verses, and you're going to want to know them, so just hang on. In Revelation chapter 21, go all the way to your right. Starting in verse 12. So Revelation 21, 12. A lamp is to be put on a lampstand so that everybody can see it. It's not to be put under a bed. It's not to be put under a bushel so everybody can see it. But he said, what about your good works and what about your bad works? So in 21.12, and, and that's not what I want. Because I don't care if she's got walls or not. How about 20? Chapter 20, verse 12. Gosh, I can't depend on David for anything. He just always puts the wrong verses up there. <laughs> Especially if I give them to him. Okay. If you see the screen go blank in a minute, it's because I threw him under the bus, and he just shut me down. <laughs> 
It's really tough preaching in this church. <laughs> in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open. Oh, no. Books were open. He wrote everything down. The books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Oh, that's, that's good. The book of life. The dead were judged according to their, would you underline it? Their what? Their works. By the things which are written in the books, and that's plural, books. But now there's one book of life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, or death and hell, delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his, would you underline it, works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, our, our stuff is written in the books. Now, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's given you eternal life, and your name is written in the book of life. But if your name's not written in the book of life, you're going to be judged according to your works. And there's lots of books with all the works in it, and everything that you've ever said, everything that you've ever done is in those books. But now remember, there's a, a book of life. Now keep that in mind for just a moment because there's going to be two different kinds of books. There's going to be a book of life, and then there's going to be a bunch of books of works. Now we're going to go back to one more passage. In Romans, go left. Romans chapter 4. If you're going to study Revelation, you better know Romans. Romans 4. We're going to start in verse 6. And we're going to read verse 6, 7, and 8. And then we're going to read verse 22. All right, now here we go. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man in, in Psalms, actually in Psalms 32, just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Now this word imputes is an accounting term. It's a CPA term that means to charge to, to charge to your account. And it is an accounting term. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes what? Righteousness to his account apart from works. Apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not, the Lord shall not impute sin. The Lord shall not account or charge to your account sin. Verse 22, therefore, Abraham, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, what in the world is God talking about here in the kingdom? In the kingdom, nothing is hidden. Nothing. And we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And here's... Here's the king sitting on the throne because we're talking about the kingdom and we're talking about at the end of the kingdom, how is this going to affect us? And the king is sitting there and everyone has to give an accounting of his works. So how is this going to work and what's it going to look like? Well, here's what it's going to look like. Do you remember when you first fell into infatuation, we call it love, and you, you kept a book, many of you kept a book, and uh, ladies, if he gave you your first flower, your first rose, you would press it in a book and dry it out, and you'd put it in this book, and you'd write on there, first date tonight, went to, he took me out to Sonic, spent $3 on me, 
Then we went to the football banquet, and this is the flower that I wore. And, and you might even sprinkle some perfume on page number one. And, and that's the book of your experiences with the love of your life. And, and if you got engaged and you're keeping a diary, you put down there on September the 4th, he asked me to marry him. We got engaged. So happy, so excited. Now, i got to ask you, in that book, if you kept the book like that, did you put what color socks he wore that night? Did you care if they were clean? No, you didn't. Now, if you did, you're in deep trouble, even today. Now, that's not the stuff we were concerned about. That's the book of love. Now, there's some legal books over here that have everything that anybody's ever said, anything everybody's done. If you are in the book of love, you're not in those books. You're in the book of life. You're in the book of love. And he's got down there when he started dating you to Jesus Christ. He's got into the first time he ever met you. He wrote it down. Everything that Jesus remembers about you, he put down there, and he remembers a lot. But this is the book of life. This is the book of love. And every good thing that happened between you and him is written down in those books. And he didn't write anything bad down in those books. He's just talking about how much he loves you and what took place there and there and there and there. And in fact, what we just read over in the book of Romans is that any bad stuff that we ever do, he burns it up. It's not hidden. It's gone. Now, there's nothing hidden. Everything's going to be brought to light. But if he burned it up and he threw it away and he cast it into the sea... As far as the east is from the west, it's gone. It's not hidden, it's gone. Now, how many of you have ever lost your keys? I can raise my hand twice, at least. But you know what? They weren't gone. They were hidden. And I found them later. Sometimes I hid them from myself without meaning to. And sometimes my grandchildren hid them. But they weren't lost, they were still there. They were just hidden. And that's the way sin is going to be if you're not in the book of life. You're going to be written down in all these books over here, in the books of the lost. Only, only it's not lost. It's just been hidden. And he writes down everything that you've ever done or said in these books. And he's going to judge you by your works. But if you're in the book of life, you're in the book of love, you're in the book of dating, you're, go you're going to be in the book that Jesus dated you and loved you, and he's going to keep all your good works. He doesn't care what color socks or if you washed them that day. That's not in that book. All those are burned up and they're gone. They're not hidden. They're gone. So when you stand before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, I need you to give an accounting of this, and he opens up the book, he doesn't open up the book of your works. Praise God! He opens up the book of love, which is called the book of life. He goes down through there and he goes, yeah, <laughs> I've got you in my book. I remember when I started dating you, and here's, here's where we got married. And you said to me, I do. This is what you were wearing that day. This is the cologne that you had that you smelled like that day. And th this is the book of love, and... Everything else is gone. Now let's read this again because this is going to be very important for you if you haven't received Christ. If you haven't said, yes, I do to Christ, and you're trying to get to heaven on your good works, this is going to be very important. Go back with me to Mark chapter 4.
We're going to start in verse 21. Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? What were we created for? To shine. Is it not to be set on a lampstand? But there's nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Baby, you better be listening because this is going to affect you. This is the nuts and bolts of the kingdom. And here's how it works. And he starts telling you how the kingdom works. He starts telling you about the rules of the kingdom. So when you get to the last throne, the last judgment seat of Christ, you can't say, I didn't know this was coming. Because he tells you in that Bible, this is coming. And here's the nuts and bolts of this thing, and here's how it works. Now, if you're in the book of life, you're in the book of love, all the bad stuff that you've ever done has been burned up. It's been cast in the sea as far as the east is from the west. And it's not even here. It's not hidden. It's gone. And when you stand before the throne of Christ, it's gone. And he opens up the book of life and he says, yes, here you are. And this is what happened here and here. And all the good works that you ever did, everything good you ever said, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. And sin, your sin is not imputed. It's not charged to you in your book. Isn't that what we just read? In Romans, that your bad things aren't charged to you in your book, but the righteousness of Christ was written in your book. Now, this is the nuts and bolts of the kingdom. This is how it's going to work. This is how it's going to work. These are the rules that God made. This is his universe. This is his kingdom. He wrote the rules. He put them in this book, and this is how it works. And when you stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you're going to be standing before your father, you're going to be standing before your husband. You're going to be standing before your best friend. You're going to be standing before the Holy Spirit of God who lives in you and is part of you. And he's going to open up this book of love with all the flowers and all the marriage licenses and all that stuff. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, he's got all the legal books right over here. You're not in that. You didn't ask to be judged according to your works. You ask to be judged according to his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his death on the cross that covers all sins if you want it to. But you have to say, yes, Lord, I do. I want to be yours forever. And I want your blood and I want your sacrifice and your substitution to cover me. Yes, and if you don't, and you tell God, I want to go to heaven, but I'm going to do it my way. I hate that song. I did it my way. Frank Sinatra did. Oops. You don't want to do it your way, because you're going to get judged according to... Okay, look at it this way. Let's say that... Let me pick on somebody else on this side. Okay, Don Jennings. You're as righteous as Billy Graham, and you only sin three times a day. It's not true, but we're using an illustration. You're only going to sin three times a day. How many days are there in a year? That's 1,000 sins a year. And if you live to be 70, you've got 70,000 sins. And you're going to open up the books, and you're going to say, Lord, I didn't sin much. Now, you go before any judge in this country, and you tell him you're not guilty, and he opens up the books, and you've got 70,000 infractions on your book. What's he going to do? <laughs> guilty! Even if you're as righteous as Billy Graham. Now, Billy get a hoot out of that. But Even if you only sin three times a day, which, which I do more than that. I've got a 1,000 sins a year. If I live to be 70, I've got 70,000 fractions, and I'm going to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Creator God who's perfect, and I'm going to tell him I didn't sin much. And he's going to go, guilty. You want to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life where he's got the marriage certificate, he's got all the plastic bracelets they ever put on you in the hospital when you had the children you and him together 
where you spewed some perfume there? And, and he says, yeah, <laughs> you're in my book. That's the book you want to be in. Now, that's the first parable because people were made to shine. And what you shine is going to be up to you. But there's nothing going to be hidden in this universe. All right, let's go to the second parable. We're probably only going to have time for a couple of parables, but, but let's go to the second parable. Point number two, we are the microcosm of the kingdom. Each believer is a microcosm of the big kingdom. You're just a little bitty kingdom of the big kingdom. So let's read this. Verse 24, Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. For the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken away from him. Now I've heard this interpreted and translated and shared in a thousand different ways. But most of them aren't what it means. This is talking about the kingdom. Now, take heed what you hear. Are you going to listen to the world? Or are you going to listen to God? Are you going to listen to Satan in the garden? Or are you going to listen to Jesus? Because who you listen to is going to determine what happens to you and what you believe. Now, listen to this. Take heed. Be, beware. Jesus said, beware what you hear. With the same measure that you use to hear, it will be measured to you. So if you're going to listen to the world, that's how you're going to be measured. You remember those books over there? If you listen to them and you want to be judged and compared to other people, that's how you're going to be measured. And he says, it will be measured to you, and you will hear more and more will be given if you listen to the right person. With the same measure that you use, whatever you listen to, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. But whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has is going to be taken away. Now, what's this talking about? Well, what we talked about in the kingdom and what Jesus taught in the kingdom. Here's how the kingdom works. In the Garden of Eden... When Adam ate that piece of fruit, he did way more than eat a piece of fruit. You say, well, what's the big deal? What he did was he surrendered. God, gave, God created the universe, the kingdom, and he gave it to us. And he surrendered the kingdom to Satan. He surrendered it all. He surrendered himself. And when he did that, he surrendered you and me. Now... Everybody belongs to Satan. And we have a sin nature. Romans says that we inherited a sin nature. You didn't just inherit Adam's sin. You inherited a sin nature. Each one of us sinned. We inherited a sin nature. Let me tell you what a sin nature is. Let me describe to you a sin nature. Here's how Jesus said it to the Pharisees. Satan is your father. No longer is God our Father, but Satan is our Father, unless you've received Christ. I'm not talking to believers. Jesus isn't talking to believers. But if you have not accepted Christ, Satan is your Father. And he said, you have the character of Satan. Now think about that for just a moment. What's the character of Satan? Is he sort of evil? He's evil incarnate. That's the, that's the character that we inherited inside of us. Now, when Adam surrendered us to Satan, he surrendered everything to Satan. We were alive spiritually, and God told Adam, if you eat that, you're going to die. And he said it this way, dying you shall die. You're going to die spiritually, and you're going to die physically. You're going to die at that moment spiritually, and you're going to continue to age until you die physically. Dying, you shall die. 
Well, what that said is that we died inside. Paul says it this way, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. So every single person that's ever born on this earth is dead spiritually. So we have to become alive spiritually. We have to receive Christ. Now let's talk kingdom for just a moment. This is what Christ has been talking about. And then we're going to come back and talk about how this fits us. Christ came the first time, and he died on the cross. And when he's standing in front of Pilate, Pilate says, Are you indeed a king? He said, Yes. He said, Have you come to, to take over the kingdom? He goes, No, not physically. If my, follower, if my kingdom was physical, my followers would fight. But now... My followers don't fight. So Jesus is talking about a spiritual deliverance. Remember that dominion we were talking about earlier? Now hang on. This is important. If you can get this, you're going to know a bunch of stuff that most seminary professors don't know. It's just coming straight out of here. The kingdom. The dominion. Jesus died on the cross, and when you accept him, you accept him spiritually. By faith. By faith. When you accept him by faith, here's what the Bible says happens. The Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, and the Holy Spirit unites with your spirit. You get married to God. The two become one and can never be separated again. That's why you can't lose your salvation. When the two become one, you have grown together, and God and your spirit unite and become one inside of you. And now your spirit is a new dominion owned by God. And if Christ has made us free, we're free indeed. We're no longer slaves to Satan. If you haven't accepted Christ, you are a slave to Satan. And he owns you. And you have the character of Christ inside of you. Because the kingdom of God is within you. If you've accepted Christ, he has united with your spirit. But let me tell you what hasn't happened yet. You don't have a new soul. And you don't have a new body. And this soul and this body have not been resurrected yet. Now one of these days Christ is coming back and when he does, we're going to get a new resurrection body. What about our soul? Okay, now here we go. We're going to spend the rest of the time, all six minutes of it. Okay. Would you come and help me for just a minute? Just, I need you to hold something. Brian, would you come? Jimmy, would you come? <laughs> Cindy. I got you with some good men, so you're not by yourself. Come on up here. All right, now here's what God's talking about. Here's how this is going to work. Would you go with me to Romans chapter 7? Romans chapter 7. I think we're going to start in verse 14. Okay, you're going to be the mind. I want you to come and stand right here in front of this desk. Thank you. You're going to be the mind. Just stand right there. Yeah, you're good right there. Okay, this is your mind right here. We're not on drugs or anything. This is your mind. Okay, now, this will be you. You're the world. Come here. You're the world. You're Satan. You're evil. Come right here and stand right here. Okay. Step, take two steps back. There you go. Okay. You're the Holy Spirit. I want you to stand over there. Okay. Now don't go away. I need your help. Let's see. I need one more young guy. Okay. Caleb, come here. We have a volunteer from the crowd. Okay. Now. I want you to stand right here, just kind of right in the middle. I want you to stand. Cameron, you stand right here, kind of right in the middle. Okay. Now, you're the arrow that's going to point from there to there. Point. No, just one hand, just because you're going to get tired. Because I want you to keep pointing. Just keep doing this. No, point towards him, the mind, the mind. Okay, so now I need you to look this way because the world... It's trying to influence your mind. Point. Keep pointing. Keep moving. 
Okay, now there's a big fight in your mind. We're going to read this in the passage in just a moment. You're not going to believe it. It's in here. It's in Romans. Okay, this is you. This is your soul. Your soul is who you really are. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. That's your soul. That's who you really are. You look at somebody and, you, and he goes, yeah, that's him. Or you look at her and she goes, yeah, that's her. Emotions. Your mind, how you think, your will, what you want, what you want out of life, how you're going to make your decisions, that's your soul. That's who you really are. You are made up of mind, will, I'm sorry, mind, oh, let me start over. You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. You have three parts, the Bible says, the spirit, a soul, and a body. Now, when you ask Jesus Christ to save you from your sins, he did. He united, the Holy Spirit united with your spirit, and it became a resurrected spirit. There's going to be a big fight inside of you for your mind. The world is going to try to affect you and change you. Everything it does is to change you. Everything on TV is pretty much to change you back to the world. But the Holy Spirit is going to use the Bible... Because you have a resurrected spirit, now the Holy Spirit and your spirit together are going to try to change your mind. And there's a big fight inside of you for your soul. Now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, God said you have been saved, your spirit. You are, according to Romans, you're being saved, your soul, right now. God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and He will not let you be lost. There's a big fight, though. And then there's your body. And it's going to be saved, but right now it looks like this. Can't help it. That's the illustration. <laughs> we pay him to take the hits. He's the youth minister. <laughs> okay, now there's a big fight going on over your mind. And really, this is your soul. Okay, you guys have done a great job. Give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Now go with me to Romans chapter 7. And this is exactly this is exactly what Paul is talking about right here. This is what Jesus is talking about in this little parable that we just read, this three path this three verse parable that we just read. This is what he's talking about. In Romans chapter 7 starting in verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. The law of God is spiritual. But I am fleshly. I'm carnal. I'm sold under sin. Even though we're saved, our soul has not been resurrected yet. There's a big fight. Verse 15, For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. What I want to do, I don't practice. But what I hate, that's what I'm doing. Now, Paul's talking about himself. Now, Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul is saved. If then I do what I will not do, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I'm saved, but there's still sin dwelling in me. My soul's not resurrected yet. But now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. There's this big fight. For the good that I would do, I do not do. But the evil that I will not do, that's what I do. I practice that. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Because he's got a resurrected spirit over here and he knows that it's wrong and he doesn't want to sin. Do you want to go around embarrassing Jesus all the time? Me neither. I don't want to do that. But I do. Paul said, what's going on inside of me? The good things that I want to do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Verse 21, I find then a law. This is the law of the kingdom. Evil is present with me. The one who wills, who wants to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, according to your spirit. 
But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind to bring me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to save my soul? Verse 25, the good news. I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. We are being saved in our soul. And he has promised that he will save our souls and that our soul will unite with our spirit in heaven and be resurrected. And then he's coming back someday and he's going to resurrect our flesh. But this is the law of the kingdom. Now, this is, this is going to be important for the next couple of minutes. Just listen up. Adam so surrendered everything to Satan. He surrendered our spirits. He surrendered our souls. He surrendered our bodies. Jesus came the first time and died on that cross so that I could be delivered from Satan's dominion spiritually. Physically, I'm still going to die. Physically, I still do things I don't want to do. I have not been delivered from his dominion in my flesh, but he has saved me, and he has saved my spirit, and because of that, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of me and unite with my spirit, and so now I've been set free from his dominion, and in my spirit and the Holy Spirit and my spirit work on my mind all the time. That's why Jesus said, I want you to pray without ceasing. I want you to meditate day and night because the world and Satan is always working on our minds. So, whoever feeds you the most is going to be the strongest in your life. That's why it's so important to read the Bible. This is what Jesus is talking about in this parable. We do not understand it as Christians. We have no idea the power that the world and Satan have over our lives until we read what Paul says, the apostle of Christ. He's one of the greatest apostles and men that's ever lived, one of the most spiritual men that's ever lived. And he said, man, I have a fight every single day in my body and in my soul. The things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Have you ever experienced that in your life? And yet you're saved. So the Holy Spirit of God works through your spirit that lives in you. You have a resurrected spirit and you've been set free. Your spirit has. There's still this fight for your soul. Now you are being saved on a daily basis because the washing of regeneration of the Holy Spirit every single day. Here's how God says it. The mercies of God are new every morning. We are being saved every day. How we feed our soul is going to determine how we act in the flesh in our bodies. So it becomes very important for us to spend time with God in the Word of God and in prayer. And we start living and acting out in our physical flesh Christ. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your lips, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. Then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have great success. And as Christians feed our soul, we start to subdue our surroundings around us, and our home becomes God's. Our home becomes Christian. Our church becomes God. Have you ever walked into a church that didn't belong to God? Woo! Our church becomes God's. Our city, if we have enough Christians that are actually doing this, our city becomes God's. And he says, pray for the peace of your city. Jeremiah 29, pray for the peace of your city. 
and our city becomes God, and then our nation becomes God. And the fight that you're seeing in this nation right now is between the world and God, and how the devil thinks and how we think, how the Spirit of God thinks. And there's a big fight going on right now, and we are not going to win it politically. This is a spiritual battle. You are not going to save your, your, your home, your kids, your spouse by doing things. You're going to save them by being on your knees, giving your life to God. And as you become more like Christ, your home becomes more like Christ. As you become more like Christ, your home becomes more like Christ, your kids become more like Christ. And it won't happen overnight. You can't quit. Don't stop. You will win. I read the end of the book. We win. Okay, now, there's two more of these parables. I will not burden you with them today. <laughs> We're through. We're through. The nuts and bolts of the kingdom. This is Jesus explaining to us how the kingdom works. And we need to know, because if you know how it works, then you can do something about it. So we've got to stop right now. We've got to, we've got to quit. But praise Jesus, our Savior, who came and set us free. I mean, we had absolutely no hope whatsoever. Completely and totally enslaved and blinded by Satan and this world. And now... We have a great hope in the love of God who wrote you in, your, in his memory book, the book of life. And now he doesn't judge you by your works. He just looks at that and sighs. <sighs> I remember when. <sighs> Ooh, she still smells good. Oh. That's how God thinks of you. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm glad he burned up all my sins because everybody who stands in front of him is going to give an account for everything they ever did unless he burned them up, threw them away. Now they don't even exist. They're not, they're not lost. They're gone. Bow with me. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for teaching us great and mighty things. Thank you for teaching us the kingdom. Thank you for letting us, the simple ones, the babies, thank you for letting us know about it. Thank you for teaching us. Lord, thank you for talking to us and giving us the great principles and the wisdom of the world. Thank you. Now, Lord, we pray that you would teach us how to meditate on your word. Teach us and help us to pray. God, may you be glorified. May our families be saved. May our nation be healed. God, use us, please. In Christ's name, amen.